Good morning and happy Sabbath, New Life family. My name is Elder Kevin Adedekun, and I personally welcome you and invite you to our worship experience today. At the moment, I'm on location in Alexandria, Virginia, and if you're watching us via Facebook or via YouTube, let us know in the live chat where you're also watching us from. Though we may be scattered abroad, we all can rest in one thing, and that we're all united by the Holy Spirit in our love for Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time to worship you, to rest from our labors, whether we've been at home or we've been at the front lines. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, filling us with praise, with worship, with adoration for your holy name. We're asking you that you lead us through this worship experience as we receive your word, as we receive your songs, Father Lord, and give a praise unto you. All these things we ask for, in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. And so though we may be scattered abroad, let us be the temples of the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ died for. Sabbath New Life family. It goes without saying that we are missing you very much here in the Brown home, but I pray that your Sabbath experience and this worship moment is a blessing to you all. We've now come to the time of our worship in which we approach God's throne together as a family in prayer. And as we prepare for our prayer this morning, I, I'm reminding of a story that's told about a pastor who was struggling to prepare his sermon and he didn't want to be disturbed by his five-year-old daughter. So he thought he came up with an ingenious idea and he took a map from his office and tore it into pieces and gave it to his daughter to assemble with the promise that he would talk and play with her when she was done putting the map back together. In his mind, he knew that she would never be able to fix that map. But to his amazement, in less than five minutes, his five-year-old daughter returned to him with the map in perfect shape, with every continent and every country in order. The surprised father and pastor asked, Honey, you don't know anything about geography. How did you fix this map so easily and so quickly? Well, to his surprise, the five-year-old daughter said to her, to her father, 
You see, Daddy, there was a picture of Jesus on the back of the map. And I knew that if I have Jesus in perfect position, then the world would also be in perfect shape. In this pandemic environment that we're in, many of you feel that your world has been torn apart, that everything is, has been flipped over on its head. But I present to you today that if Jesus is in perfect position in our world, then all of our pieces will come together and our world will be in perfect shape. So I invite you now to bow your heads with me as we pray to the God of heaven that Jesus will be in perfect position in our lives so that even though things may be chaotic and out of control, that with Jesus in perfect position, our world will also be in perfect shape. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, what a privilege it is to approach your throne in prayer. And even though our family has been separated and quarantined, we're not able to be together, we know, Lord, that we are one in you. Lord, this morning, I pray that you'll bless your people wherever they are. I pray that your spirit will be in every home, that mothers and fathers and children, that their hearts are being knit together in love by your presence being there. And especially in this worship moment, I pray that every home, every living room, bedroom, wherever they're sitting, will become like a sanctuary. May they feel and sense your very presence as we worship and pray to you today. We ask God that your blessings will be upon all your people everywhere, that you'll especially be with those who have been impacted by this COVID-19. Some are laying in hospital beds. Some are home quarantined and can't interact with loved ones. And Lord, some have even lost their lives. But I pray, Lord, that you'll come and be a peace and comfort to all of them. And we also pray that you'll be with those that are in leadership positions, that you'll guide them to make wise decisions that will be a benefit to your people. Lord, I pray for the body of Christ, for the churches everywhere, that our ministry will be relevant for this time. And for even us as individuals, God, speak to us through your spirit to give us the right words and actions that will point people to you and show them that God is still in control. I pray for mothers and fathers who are all of a sudden educators, that you'll bless them with wisdom and patience. And I pray for our children that their hunger and thirst for knowledge will not wane, but that they will commit and apply themselves to the instruction that their parents have given them so that together all of them, mother, father, and children will be elevated as they submit themselves to you, as you touch their minds and educate them to higher levels of learning. Lord, I pray also now for our elderly. We have heard, God, that nursing homes and assisted living places have become hotbeds of infection. We pray, God, that you'll shield them and protect them and bless them in these environments. And now, God, we pray for the spoken word for our pastor as he prepares to deliver the word to us today. Wherever we are, God, please prepare our hearts and minds to hear your word. And may it have find a lodging place in our hearts and have an effect on us, Lord, that will change us and make us more like Jesus. So once again, Lord, we thank you for this worship moment. And we thank you for the promise that wherever two or three are gathered, you're right there in the midst. So bless us now and keep us and may our Sabbath day experience be an enriched and blessed one for us all. And we thank you for being our God and Father and for hearing this prayer. For we pray it in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. Amen. At this moment, we would like to tell you about our giving opportunities at New Life. Simply navigate to nlsdac.org and press the menu item circled in blue. From there, you will find the menu item, Giving. This is where you'll find options to enter in your tithe and your offering and any other budgetary items that you'd like to contribute to our church and conference. We 
Once you've completed all of those items, you will see your grand total at the bottom. Simply press continue. From here, you have three options. You can either log in with an existing account, register for a new account, or proceed as a guest. We're gonna proceed as a guest. We will then enter in our information, our name, our address, our email address. That's very important so that you receive confirmation. Then we'll be prompted with our payment options. We can select a credit card or debit card or a check. We're gonna select debit card. From here, we will enter our credit card information in full and then proceed to the next screen for the summary of what we have performed. Once you hit submit, that's it.
Hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. I wanna give a very warm welcome to all of our regular members and attendees at New Life. But if this is your first time tuning in, I just wanna say thank you uh, for viewing our service at this time. We, we pray that this will be a blessing. So we are actually in the middle of a series. There's no particular title uh, to this series, even though the theme of it is spiritual disciplines. And there are so many, um, you know, other words or phrases that can be used as, you know, some people call it um, uh, spiritual formation, uh, spiritual disciplines. Uh, you know, we could just simply call it how to become more like Jesus. That's the, those are the goals. Of, that's the main goal of spiritual disciplines. So we could just leave it at that. Um, and so the past couple of weeks, especially last week, we uh, took a look at what to do when we are living an unhurried life. And the reality is that, you know, because of this COVID-19 crisis, we have no choice but to live an unhurried life at this point. We're, we're not going to and from work for, for most of us. The vast majority of us are at home. There's no traffic. Uh, you know, we, we're not rushing off to really do much at all. And so that is part of the framework of where I believe God is leading us to just to just to get us to slow down a bit, uh, to see and kind of gauge where exactly we are with him. This is the best time to do it. There's not going to be any time like this in a very long time, I would guess. So today we have a passage of scripture that our talk will be based on. And so I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles, whether you have a physical Bible or uh, digitally, whatever it is, go to Romans chapter 12. And we're going to look at the first two verses of Romans 12, just two verses today, one and two. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. It says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. One of my favorite cartoons growing up was a character by the name of Popeye the Sailor Man. You've probably heard that, uh, that name before. One of my favorites, I, I, I like old school cartoons. I like Looney Tunes and all that, Tom and Jerry. These are like really, really old cartoons, but, but by far my favorite uh, that I grew up watching was Popeye the Sailor Man. Now, uh, there are uh, some characters in, in that cartoon. Obviously, you have Popeye and his uh, profession was a sailor man. That's pretty obvious from, from the uh, title of the cartoon. But then you also had another character. Her name was Olive Oil. And uh, that was Popeye's girlfriend. Okay, Popeye loved himself some Olive Oil. But then you have, had another character. Uh, and he was the rival of Popeye. His name was Bruno. Bruno was a large man and he was a mean man. Um, and so Bruno, interestingly enough, liked Popeye's girlfriend, Olive Oil. And uh, sometimes Bruno would try to, uh, maybe you can call it come on to her or um, you know, tried to talk to her in a, a romantic way and Olive Oil was having nothing of it. But then Bruno would uh, many times kidnap Olive Oil uh, because she uh, denied his advances. And when that happened, Popeye would have to go and rescue his girlfriend from the clutches of Bruno. And so Popeye you know, many times when he would go to uh, to rescue his girlfriend, uh, he would end up having to fight Bruno, whether it be in a boxing ring, wrestling ring, or wherever it is, and it would just be bad for Popeye. He he would get whooped. Uh, Bruno would just put a, a, a whooping up, a, up on him uh, as bad as Popeye had ever seen, until until Popeye somehow squeezed like in his back pocket or out of his shoe or what have you, uh, there would be a, a can of spinach that Popeye would have randomly on his person. And uh, that would get, the, the, the spinach would squeeze out of the can somehow and uh, jump into Popeye's mouth. He would eat it, digest it, 
and he would become as strong as he had ever been. And then he would end up uh, knocking Bruno out and he would save his girlfriend from the clutches of Bruno. Now, that's not the point that I want you to get. I'm just simply describing here. Here's my point uh, about bringing up Popeye the Sailor Man. See, Popeye was your regular run of the mill man, obviously before he ate his uh, his spinach, which made him strong. And I, you know, I get the feeling that there, you know, there, there wasn't anything special about Popeye. There, there was nothing that really stuck out. He was just a plain guy, sailor, um, you know, didn't necessarily seem to be well-educated or what have you. He, you know, he was just a run-of-the-mill guy and didn't have much special going on. And, and, and you know, when, when Popeye was at his weakest, he would kind of have this, uh, this saying about himself. He would say, uh, I am what I am, right? In, in other words, I, you know, there's nothing special about me. You know, I, I am what I am. I, I, I'm weak. I, I constantly lose the battle. I, I, I'm clumsy. He, he was normally clumsy. He, you know, like I said, Popeye wasn't anything to write home about. And he would just say, I am what I am. You know, I, there's not much going on to me. And, and when he was really in dire straits, he would say, I am what I am. And that's all I am, right? There, there was sort of this, uh, this view of himself, this, this almost disappointment about himself that, hey, look, it, it, it is what it is. This is who I am, and there's not much that I can do about it. There, there's a disappointment uh, uh, about Popeye. And if, if you're living and breathing, if you're a human, you have been there before. Certainly I have. You know, there, there's so many disappointments that I have about myself. And, and uh, many of us in today's society would chalk the problem up to maybe low self-esteem or a failure to accept myself as I am. And, and that certainly may be part of the answer. But I, I'm here to declare that that definitely isn't the whole answer. That That is a humanistic part of the answer uh, to, to our dilemmas of the disappointment in ourselves, but that's not the whole problem. Here's what I, I would submit to us today, uh, that my failure is more so not being able to live out who God created me to be. This is just a human problem across the board. From the least of us to the greatest of us, we all have issues with the disappointment. We, we all suffer from disappointment in ourselves for not living out our lives as best as we can. And, you know, look, I, I have been there, I, I'm there almost just about every day, disappointed uh, because I, I'm undisciplined many times. Uh, disappointed because I can be mean. Uh, you know, we, we all have and live with these disappointments about ourselves because we're not reaching that, maybe that pinnacle point that we know that God has created us to be. And there's a lesson that I like to draw out about uh, Michelangelo, the, the great Renaissance artist. He was a sculptor, painter, so on and so forth. But he had this, uh, this work of art, this sculpture called Pieta. And it was about, uh, it was of Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, clutching her crucified son. And she was in anguish, so on and so forth. And, and uh, several years ago, this fanatic, uh, saw it on display and he took a, a sledgehammer and he began to attack and beat down, yea, even destroy this sculpture called Pieta of, of Mary. And, uh, you know, as disappointing as that was, guess what happened? The Vatican artists that uh, were employed at that time, they picked up the pieces of this destroyed sculpture and they pieced it back together again, so much so that you can't even notice with, you know, with the blind eye that this was something that got attacked by a sledgehammer, right? And I, 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 I tell us this story because, uh, you know, as many times as we've been disappointed in our lack of progress, disappointed in the things that we've done and disappointed in the things that we have not done, uh, I, I'm confident that God is able to pick up the broken pieces, the, the pieces of disappointment, the pieces 
where we know that we haven't reached that pinnacle point where that, that God has created us for. Yes, he can recreate us to make us look like not what we look like right now, not what we look like several years ago, but to make us look like the work of art that he indeed created us to be. That's why the, the Apostle Paul says in uh, one of his letters that we are God's workmanship, that, 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 that God has sculpted us to be a beautiful work of art. And, and we've been destroyed. We've been destroyed by so many things. We've been destroyed by the enemy. We've been destroyed by ourselves, by, by our own choices. We've been destroyed by other people's choices, things that they have done to us. We have been attacked with a sledgehammer time and time again. But guess what? We are still God's workmanship and he will pick up these marble pieces, the, the pieces that he created for beauty that have now been destroyed. And he is willing to put us back together again, so much so that no one would ever guess or notice that we had been attacked. Matter of fact, the Bible suggests that we will be even more beautiful when God is finished with us than we were before. Come on and say amen, somebody. I can't wait for that. Matter of fact, this is something that has been going on as soon as you said yes to Jesus Christ. He began to recreate you in the form and in, in, the, in the likeness of Jesus Christ. That process is called transformation. Transformation. That's right. See, transformation is um, is the is the the desire or the hope of every single human heart. I don't care if you're a Christian, not a Christian. I don't care if, whatever whoever you are, you want transformation. That's why. That's why we go to therapy, right? That's why we join the gym, the local gym. Why? Because we want transformation of our bodies. That's why. We get into recovery groups because we don't want to be under the the uh, the uh, power of addiction anymore. That's why we read self help books. That's why uh, we go to motivational seminars. That's why we make New Year's resolutions. Why? Because we as humans crave the possibility of transformation. That's who. That's what we really want in the heart of hearts. That's what all of us want is transformation, right? But we have to be very careful in our society, in this age that we live in, to not substitute humanistic um, answers for divine-sized holes in our hearts. Yeah, we can read the best self-help books, but if it doesn't include the transformation that Jesus is willing to put us through as his workmanship, then it is a com incomplete solution to the ultimate problem. All right. So, you know, we, we have this solution that Paul gives us in uh, that we already read in Romans uh, chapter 12. And I'm going to read verse two uh, for us again. It says, here's what Paul says here, here. Here's the solution to the human problem. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be what everybody transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, the Apostle Paul uses these two, these two words, conform. He said, don't be conformed. And then he says, instead of being conformed, you need to be conformed to the world. That is, you need to be transformed by the renewing of your minds. They're th these two rich, I mean, these these Greek words are pregnant. The original New Testament was, was written in Greek. And, and, and these Greek words, when they're translated in, into English, we, we don't really get the full essence of their, of their meaning. But when we go back to the original Greek and, and see uh, what these words uh, mean, the, the full meaning, see, being conformed, uh, that word, that Greek root word is schema, schema. And where we get our, our English word scheme, uh, and it means originally to copy a pattern, right? You can see something and then you can copy it as best as you can. That schema that is conform. The Apostle Paul says, "Do not do that." All right, don't. That, that's not. That's not what you want. And he said, "What you do want is to be transformed, and that is morphe, from where we get our English word morph." or uh, metamorphosis, right? 
And it, that that is uh, that is like the, the best way I can describe that is like a caterpillar um, being metamorphed into a uh, butterfly, right? This isn't just a schema, a conformity. This, uh, a butterfly isn't anything like a caterpillar at all. The butterfly had, or the caterpillar rather, has morphed into a butterfly, something that is totally unlike the caterpillar in any way. And so when you are transforming, you are morphing into something that you don't even look like currently. And I, I'm, I'm getting, I'm trying to get us to understand that spiritual disciplines, whether it's prayer, reading the Bible, whether it's solitude, whatever it might be, is not about conformity. It is not about just copying a pattern or seeing what somebody else has done and trying to do that. And there's there's something to be said for uh, best practices, yes. But there's even more to be said about being transformed, being transformed. This is the goal of spiritual disciplines. This is the goal of becoming like Jesus Christ. It is not what's on the exterior. It's what, what's on the interior. I, I love how Strong's comparison, this book uh, of uh, that kind of looks at the, the, the um, uh, important words of the Bible and, and kind of compares them to each other. Here's what Strong's Comparison says, it says, both morphe, transformation, and schema, uh, which is uh, well, conforming, uh, denote outward form, but as including one's habits, activities, and modes of action in general. In morphe, that's transformation, it is also implied that the outward form expresses, get this, the inner essence, an idea which is absent from schema, from conformity. Morphe expresses the form as that which is intrinsic and essential. Schema uh, signifies the figure, the, the, the shape, as that which is more outward and accidental. And, and I'm ending my quote right there. So in other words, let me just break that down for us very, very quickly. See, transformation and uh, uh, being transformed and being conformed may look the same from the outside. Right. Outwardly, or just the shell of things, trans, being transformed and being conformed may look exactly the same. But where they where things become different, we're talking about from the human perspective now, where things are different between being transformed and conformed is that transforming morphe comes from the place of inward transformation. It expresses the inner essence, it says. And that inner essence begins to transform not just inside, but outside. But, but uh, what, on the other hand, schema, the con conforming only is concerned about what's on the outside. If you're with me so far, go on and say amen, right? So transforming goes to down to the structure. It changes, changes the composition while conformity only changes the outline or the shape or the contour. Transformation goes a lot deeper. And we should not be satisfied, people of God, with conforming in church. We should not be satisfied with just changing the exterior of who we are while we are still the exact same on the inside. Right. Uh, you know, there, there's a there's a better way that that I, I'd like to uh, I, I'd like to describe this. See, I, I have a little prop for us right here. And as you can see, I have right here in my hands. I have a green chair, right? Now, when you hear the words green chair in my household, um, that is a cause for being upset. That is a cause for uh, just a lot in my household. Here's exactly why. All right. So the story goes back several years ago when my wife and I, we 
bought a um, chair and uh, table and chair set for our sons. Now, uh, we have obviously, like I said, we have a table and four chairs and we uh, all of the chairs are four different colors. So there are blue, there's a red chair, there's a yellow chair, and then there is this green chair. Now, the reason why I say that this green chair has been the source of just a lot of mess in my household is because, and I'm not even quite sure where or how it started, but um, when, I, when when we uh, make finish making dinner and we call the kids to come and eat dinner, they, they eat at their, their table uh, and, and chair set that we bought for them. And one day, one of our kids... Uh, said when we called them for dinner, I've got the green chair. And they would run to the green chair and sit down in it. And all of a sudden, that was just a cause for the other sons to be upset, uh, to complain, yea, even to cry. Why? Because they weren't in the green chair like the one brother was. Right. And it probably sounds so silly. It sounds so crazy. Uh, yes, th this is like the craziest thing that, that you could ever think of. Um, and, the, you know, the, the, the thing is, there's nothing special about this green chair at all. Right. Th nothing special about it. The only difference about this green chair, as opposed to all of the other chairs, the blue one, the red one and the yellow one, is simply the pigment of color that it, that well, that was used when it was manufactured. That is it. This green chair isn't more comfortable. Uh, it doesn't feel better. It, there's not more better support or anything. It's not bigger or smaller. Nothing. There is nothing uh, that is about this green chair that that sticks out, except for the fact that my sons got it in their minds that the green chair was better than all the other chairs. And this has, again, has been a cause of so much heartache, yelling and screaming, so on and so forth in my, uh, in the life of my family. Now, here's what has happened. Here's what, happened, just on the psychological level, my, my kids have now created this, uh, this culture where the green chair separates uh, the person that is in the in-group from those that are on the outside, right? Uh, though the, you know, it, it, it has been, you know, if, if you get to the green chair first, you are now the cool Levy brother. And if you are not in the green chair, sitting in the green chair at dinner time or any other time, then you are not the cool Levy brother. It, it's just so crazy and mind blowing, so much so that we have now remove the green chair. We have banned them from sitting in the green chair at meal times. Uh, matter of fact, it got so bad that they started using other chairs. We took away the green chair and they started using the, the yellow chair. Uh, that was cool. And, and we had them all stand up and eat their dinner as a threat as to what will happen eventually if they keep playing this crazy game and making everybody else mad around them. But anyways, so, the, you know, this, this has not been a, a separation or uh, a mode of separation between who's in and who is not. Now, here, here, here is when, when we get into the spiritual realm everywhere. And this isn't just for church, but this is just humanity. Uh, he, we always we have always created these markers, if you will, that separates those who are in from those who are out. And we've done it in church. We've done it spiritually. We've created these spiritual uh, these spiritual markers between who is in and who is out. So for instance, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, um, he, he, he's challenging this Corinthian community. He says, look, if, if, I, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, he's addressing speaking in tongues because this was a spiritual marker uh, that, that, that they had created in this community to separate those uh, who were more spiritual, who they thought were more spiritual than those who they thought weren't as spiritual. So if you could not, if you did not engage in the spiritual gift, then you really weren't spiritual. He said, look, I, I could speak in, in the tongues of men and of angels, but if I do not have love, then I am nothing. I could have all any spiritual gift, any, any spiritual marker, 
But what's most important, rather than uh, these things that these uh, surface things that that separate those who are in from those who are out, what's most important is what's in the heart, and what's in the heart is love. If I if I have all of these these things that that make me look spiritual, but if I don't have what's really important, and that's love in my heart, then I'm really not transformed. People of God, I, I'm I'm here to let us know that there is no spiritual marker that is greater than love for God and love for each other. But yet we engage in what could be called false transformation where we, 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 we use these external things that, that separate or seem to separate us from those who are on the outside. And by the time Jesus came uh, to the scene uh, when he was born and when he lived, there were so many exterior things that people were using to separate them from everybody else. So things like circumcision, uh, you know, those, those who were circumcised and those who were not. And by the time we get to the book of uh, book of Acts, there was this big argument um, about who, you know, are, are we going to allow people that are not circumcised to be in our our exclusive group? Are, are they really all that spiritual if they don't have this exterior form of what we believe uh, separates us. And they, they had this big council of, of Jerusalem where there were like all the big wigs and, and those who were you know making the, uh, important decisions in the church. They were trying to decide if circumcision was necessary to be declared a, uh, a Christian. And they figured out, hey, this is not a necessary thing. There, there are other things like, like the Sabbath and not that I, I believe the Sabbath is unimportant. It is very, very important. But the parameters around the Sabbath that people had created was something that um, that was being used to separate those who are in from those who are out. So, for instance, if you uh, you know if, if you um, step this many steps, uh, walk this many steps on the Sabbath, if you went beyond that threshold, then you were no longer spiritual. If you were under that threshold of steps on the Sabbath, then you were okay. Uh, if you tithed on all of your uh, grains, um, you know, that, then you were OK. But if you did not do those things that, you know, there were always these things. And it's no wonder that Jesus began to rebuke uh, the the religious leaders of his day. He said, look, you you are like whitewashed tombs. Yeah, you you you, you, you look beautiful on the outside. You've conformed very, very well. You've conformed uh, exterior wise. You have everything going on from your dress to how you eat, to uh, how, how you are greeted in the synagogue, to what the things uh, you say, to how you pray. You look great. You but it's like a whitewash tomb. You look great on the exterior, but on the inside, you're full of dead, men, dead men's bones. You, you You've missed the mark. Because you have lacked transformation. Yes, you've conformed well, but you have not transformed. And so Jesus, uh, all throughout the Gospels, he's rebuking the religious leaders. But, but on the flip side, we find him giving words of encouragement to those that were on the fringes, the spiritual fringes, people like tax collectors and, and prostitutes. He praised them many times. He sat down and ate with them. Why? Well, because they understood that it wasn't about that that outward conformity. Yet, yeah, yeah, do do we need things to, to, to look good on the outside? I believe that there is value in that. I believe that behavior should change, but behavior should change uh, because I am transformed by the power of God's love, right? And so these tax collectors and, um, and, and prostitutes, yes, they had some negative paths. Yes, they, they, they were hit with a sledgehammer. Their workmanship was all over the place. But because they allowed Jesus to transform them, to pick up their pieces, Jesus praised them. He says, look, man, you are closer to salvation than some of those that, that you would think were, 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 were much closer than you. Why? Because you've allowed me to transform who you are. You've allowed me to transform you. And that's exactly what we have to do to become like Jesus. It's not about me doing it in my power. 
It's not about me um, doing anything. This is about me allowing Jesus to work inside me to transform who I am by his love. Last text of scripture that I'd like to um, I'll point out for us is a parable that Jesus gives because the, the question is, okay, how can we tell, how can we tell that uh, when, when people are transformed and when they are not, first and foremost, how can I tell, you know, I, I, I don't need to do as much telling about somebody else as I need to do about me. And, and, and first and foremost, if you are loving God and others more than you were a year ago, a month ago, a week ago, however long, then that's how you know that you are being transformed. You, you may not feel it in the moment. You may not sense it right now. But when you look over your life, if you keep a journal, that, that might be a good practice because you can see how you are you have responded in the past and now you say, okay, I, I'm not responding like that anymore. I'm, I'm being more kind. I'm not all the way there yet. I, you know, God is still working on me. I'm not where I know I want to be. I'm still, I still have these disappointments. I am what I am. Uh, you know, uh, even, even when I don't want to be, uh, you know, what I used to be, I, you know, look, I still am what I am, but I'm trusting God to work things out in my life. When I see over my life and I'm loving God more and I'm loving people more, then that's how I know that I am making progress and I'm being transformed. Now, now the, the, the other question is about how can we know when others are being transformed? How can we know that they really are on the inside or on the outside? How, how can we judge? Now, let me just say first and foremost that we ought not judge, but th this parable is going to help us to understand why we should not judge people. Okay, here it is. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 29. I'm reading, reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Here's what, it, here's what it says. In another parable, he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, verse 28, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go uh, and gather them up? But he said, no, lest you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Look, this, this parable is about those who have been conformed and those who are transformed. Here's why I say that. Because the wheat and the tares, they didn't really... Uh, they, they, they couldn't really tell which one was really a wheat, a, a wheat plant and which one was really a tear plant until things were full grown. It takes time to really tell who is conformed and who is transformed. And so the farmer said, look, no, no, don't 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 uproot anything lest you uproot something accidentally. And that's why we ought not judge people, because we might accidentally judge somebody uh, and, and say that they are outside because we've looked on their exterior. They look like a tear. They look like a weed when in, uh, actually they were wheat and we uproot something good. Jesus says, do not judge because everything that looks bad on the outside may not be bad. He said, wait till the full, wait till everything is full grown until everything becomes mature. And, and when people are maturing, you either mature in this direction or you mature in the other direction. Meaning you, you become more of what you are as time goes on. That's what that means. So if you're weak, you become even it becomes clear that you are weak as time goes on. If you are a weed it becomes even more clear as time goes on that you are, it will become painfully obvious that you are a weed. But just give people time. 
Don't uproot them. Time will tell who is conformed or who is transformed. If that makes sense, go on and say amen. Last thing, last thing. We want to become transformation agents by the power of Jesus Christ. And the only way to do that is by the power of love. I love what John says in one of his letters. He says, look, if you love, then you know God. You've put on Jesus Christ. But if you do not love, you don't know who God is. It, it, it's very simple. The, the line of demarcation isn't anything on the exterior, even though the exterior, it, you know, it, it does change. It should change the, the longer we live with Jesus Christ. Yes, our exterior needs to change. Obviously, yeah, that, that, that is correct. But the essence of transformation isn't the exterior. It's if we love. If you love, you know God. If you do not love, you don't know who God is. So people of God, I, I submit to us today that we allow love to be that transformation agent in our lives. That we be unwilling to be conformed to this world, conformed to any human, um, human traditions or whatever it might be, but that we be transformed by the renewing of our minds and allow love to be that deciding factor of who is inside and who is outside. Look, thank you so much for tuning in. I pray that your decision today will be sealed in the courts of heaven and that you will decide to love God and love each other. God bless you. See you next week. Thank you, Pastor Troy, for your timely message today. I hope that the message has touched your heart as much as this touched mine. And as we go out through our week, let us keep mindfulness about those that are in need of help. Whether you're at home or you're at the front lines, everybody needs Jesus Christ. And everybody has physical, mental, and spiritual needs. Whatever you have, reach out to somebody, a stranger, a friend, and let them know your love for God through your act of kindness through your act of empathy. Let us pray. Lord Heavenly Father, we just want to ask you for your filling of your Holy Spirit once more throughout this week. Be with us, whether we're at home or we're abroad. Be with our loved ones, be with our families, be with our communities. Be with the strangers. Be with those that are in need, Father Lord. Use us as your chosen vessels to help meet their need. Father Lord, let us take the word that we receive today and engraft it into our hearts that it may grow and be fruitful, and that not only us, but our families and our communities may eat of the goodness of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, and until we meet again, in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.